book of Acts chapter 10. It's in the New Testament. Man, it is beautiful outside, isn't it? How many of you have plans right after this? Going to get with your family today, eat a big meal. Going to get with your couch today, take a big nap. Going to get with your car today and drive around the countryside. Big plans. I'm so glad to see you today. Would you sing with me? Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Sing that again, church. And Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary. For you. Now sing this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Sing amen. Amen. Man, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. To worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Father, that's our prayer this morning, that you are glorified, that all things will dissipate right now. Everything else can disappear but you right now. In the next 15 minutes, God, you would just flow all over this place, that people would recognize your very presence, God. And then as we prepare to close this service, God, that you would go before us. Heavenly Father, teach us from your word right now. Thank you for the apostles. Thank you for Peter, whom we read from, uh, about in just a moment, God. Thank you for, for allowing us the opportunity to understand your word. Thank you for our history in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Acts chapter 10, I want to talk to you about the apostle Peter. Listen, he found himself in front of a household of non-Jewish people in Acts chapter 10. He found himself in front of a household of them like, like you and I. These people were Gentiles. You ever introduce yourself to someone that way? Hello, I'm Matt. I'm a Gentile. I won't get you very far this day and age, but uh, technically they were doomed. The, this household of people that he was presenting to, they were doomed to eternal death. Technically... Essentially, they were without hope, and they were without God's grace, and, and they didn't know what promise meant, not like the people of Israel did. 
They didn't know. And, and, but Peter had a message for them, and so he presented himself before them in a very interesting way. Now, the home belonged to a soldier by the name of Cornelius. You ever meet anyone by the name of Cornelius? It's not very common anymore, but Cornelius was a, uh, a soldier. But he wasn't just a common soldier. He wasn't just an ordinary, everyday soldier. He was a career soldier. He was the coolest of cool when it came to soldiers, right? He was like the G.I. Joe of that day. Anybody grow up with G.I. Joe? Man, so cool. And knowing is half the battle, you know. And so there's that. So he was, he was a centurion. That's really cool. I picture him just when he was ready to go to work, on his way out the house, you know, he's all girded up with all of his loins covered, right? Because that's what, that's what you say in the Bible, right? His loins were covered. I don't know what a loin is, unless it has something to do with dinner. But anyway, so anyway, he was, he was all covered up in, in probably very fancy, fancy armor, you know, and he was a centurion, and at that time, a Roman commander of a hundred men, therefore, a hundred men considered a century. You kind of getting the idea there? A centurion was over a century of people. And so, needless to say, Cornelius was respected by the Jewish people. As you can read about in verse 22 of chapter 10, he was respected by the Jewish people. And in some contexts, he was feared by the Jewish people, as you can imagine why. And so, Peter was directed by the Spirit to meet Cornelius. And at about the same time, Cornelius, Cornelius was directed by an angel to seek out Peter. It's kind of cool, right? It's an interesting story. And so Cornelius and Peter, they were destined to meet because God ordained that they would meet. And when they met, Cornelius literally, this, this career soldier, this bad of the bad, he was decked out, I would vision, envision. All for battle. And Cornelius meets Peter. And the Bible tells us he falls down at Peter's feet. And he begins to worship Peter. Verse 25 tells you that. Begins to worship Peter. And Peter, he corrects him. And Peter says, get up, get up. He, he was not to be worshipped. That's what Peter's telling him. He says, get up. And then this Roman soldier and leader told Peter that he'd been praying. And God told him to send for Peter. Now, there were a few occasions, there are a few occasions than this in Scripture that speaks directly to how you and I can be saved since we are not Jews. Very few. But this particular passage is all about us. I love this. I love this. The term that has stuck with me all week is in awe of grace. In awe of grace of grace. As we approached this day, this Resurrection Sunday, as we approached this day, I looked forward to talking to you about being in awe of grace. And we talked about it a little bit last week, but I want you to understand something. Today, this day is a day that represents, hear me, it represents the day that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, was raised from the dead. And that's amazing. That is the best story. But the thing is, it's not a story. It happened. And I believe it happened. I believe it so much that I've dedicated my life to stand before you and tell you about the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news that was so important that in this day, so long ago, Peter stood before a group of people who were not intended to receive that message necessarily until God decided that they needed to meet. And then he stood before them and told them the very same good news that I'm going to tell you about. The very same good news that in just a little bit, we're going to partake of a piece of bread and a little cup of juice that represents the body of Christ. And the blood of Christ that represents what he did on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, just like I was telling the little guys a while ago. And they knew. Adeline knew what I was talking about. And I'm so proud of you. That's so good. And so the term in awe of grace, I'm not even sure that we can comprehend the depth of that term this morning, but I want to try. And so I want you to read with me Acts chapter 10, 
verses 34 through 43. And as we often do here at Journey Church, I'm going to ask you if you would stand with me in honor of God's Word. So Peter has been called. He's met with with Cornelius. They've shook hands. He picked him up off the ground. And and this is where he's brought before Cornelius' household. And verse 34 says, So Peter opened his mouth, and he said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. Who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and of the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Do you know where we get the first clue of grace in Scripture? I would contend that if you really think about it, I believe you'll find that the first clue in Scripture says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. And darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning. Day one. Genesis chapter one. Verses one through five. I would contend that that is the first time we get a glimpse of God's grace. Since that time, God has been separating light from darkness. Yet inevitably, man, us, has tried to hide in the darkness. And all the while, God's grace is finding those areas and shining his light into it. All the while that we might try to hide everything that we try to keep from him, God's light shines on it. And that sounds like a bad thing, right? Because when we're hiding from God, we don't want him to see the bad things going on in our life, the things that we're doing that might separate us from him, because that's the definition of sin. Sin is anything that separates us from God. And there are sins of omission, And there are sins of commission. Sins of omission are things that we should be doing for God, with God, about God, that we do not do. Things that we should be doing that God has asked us to do, like maybe have a relationship with Him. That's a sin of omission. And sins of commission, I would tell you sins are things that, those types of sins are things that we might do against someone else or do against God that we're not supposed to do that we know we shouldn't do, but we do them anyway. So we have sins of omission and sins of commission. And if you think about it, there are none who are innocent of either of those types of sins. None of us are innocent of either of those types of sins. In fact, Scripture tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us. We've all sinned, and we fall short of the glory of God. And so we have been trying to hide from God. But it's impossible to hide from God. If you ask certain people, they might tell you that this wasn't God's original plan. After creation, God would share it with the first man and the first woman. He would share creation with the first man and first woman. But they made mistakes. They made mistakes that could not be overlooked. And forgiven, yes, they were, but not overlooked. And as a result, the first man and the first woman, we know them as Adam and Eve, And so the first man and the first woman became the first sinners separated from God. It seems we've continued that legacy, doesn't it? We continue down these paths. 
Yet God would exhibit his grace again. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, when their sin was exposed to them, and they understood that they were naked. That's what Scripture tells us about that in Genesis chapter 3. So their sins were exposed to them. And God would exhibit his grace once again, where it says that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and they clothed, and he clothed them. From that point forward, even until today, even until each and every one of us sitting in this room, from that point forward, God would show his grace to the offspring of these people, of Adam and Eve. God would show his grace to them countless times. He would do so, and the same number of times these people would defy him. The same number of times these people would turn their back on him. The same number of times these people would cheat on him. The same number of times these people would fail him. And when I say these people, let me tell you something. I'm first in line. If you sit in this room today and you think, that, that doesn't describe me at all, I want you to listen very closely. There's none, none righteous. No, not one. These people that I'm talking about, they came to be known as Judeans. Shortened, the people would call them Jews. Now, the probability that some in here share undiluted DNA with these people, this people group, is statistically pretty low. In the early part of the relationship between God and this people group, he would tell them to avoid connection with people who were not already his own. It seems that you and I, we were doomed based upon God's direction to his people, the Jews, Israel. In the Old Testament, the prophets who preached the message of God to the people, they would prophesy about a coming Messiah who would deliver them from bondage. Bring them together. Help them to rise to the glory that God intended for them to have in the first place. When he promised to Abraham, you see all this sand out here? That's how many kids you're going to have. Can you imagine that child support? You see all these stars out here? Even though we can't see all the stars, right? You see all these stars up here? That's your legacy of people. I'm going to make you as great as that. I'm going to make you as many as this. God promised that to them. And so here they were, they were going through history, and they were in bondage, and they were set free, and they were in bondage to, the, bondage to their own self, and they were set free, and God would rescue them. They were in bondage to the enemy, and they were set free, and God would rescue them again. They would speak more than 300 prophecies about Jesus who would come to set his people free. 300 prophecies. Again, the statistical improbability of this is astronomical. Yet Jesus would fulfill more than 300 prophecies. I want you to understand something. That's statistically improbable. Yet Jesus would do so. And that was no accident. He came on purpose. To save people who didn't want him. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Talking about Jesus Christ, he came unto his own, and his own didn't want him. The scholars and the devout followers of God and even the career ministry leaders, they would hold on to the thought that only they would receive the manifestation of God's grace. And it makes sense if you think about it, that the Jewish Messiah would save only the people that God had historically saved from bondage in Egypt, had marched them into the promised land in Canaan, and provided for them even when they rebelled against him. So it makes sense. He had invested in them, so why wouldn't he save them again, you know? And then Jesus comes on scene. And with what seemed like a whole new purpose, he turns out to be God's original plan all along. That's fantastic if you think about it. It seems like God had just set aside these people to be his followers. It just seems like every blessing that he promised would only go to these people. And here comes Jesus and shows us that all those blessings for those people 
Our spiritual brothers and sisters, I'll go so far as to say, all those blessings were meant for us too. Jesus preached a message using a broader definition of his people. And he refers to the world that he came to save. If you think about it, he refers to the world as a whole and not just the Jewish people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. That's the good news I was talking about. That's the good news that Peter stood before this household of Gentiles, this household of pagans, it seems, and pagans who are learning more about God and turning their lives over to Him through Jesus Christ. Jesus preached a message that was broader in definition. His life would be about forgiveness and mercy, not just condemnation for failed observance of a law that they didn't even understand in the first place, really. And so even though He would not speak against the law, instead, Matthew Matthew 5, 17 tells us that he came to fulfill the law. Jesus was the perfect representation of the fulfillment of the law of Moses. He would connect with sinners. He would dine with ill-reputed people. He would, con- he would hang out with people who were considered to be condemned already. He'd wash the feet of his followers, though his were the only ones that John the Baptist said he was unworthy to put sandals upon. Jesus. And when all of this started to come to light, the Jewish leaders didn't like it very much. This man, Jesus, he really shook things up. He really turned it upside down. And what I would suggest to you is that before Jesus came to us, The earth was once again formless and void. And darkness was all over the face of the earth. And at that time, the Jew had no homeland, had no permanent land, had no promised land at all. And and they resented everyone for it. And here they were, the original chosen people, and they were treated like they didn't belong. Could it be? Because they didn't take care of what God had promised them and had given them in the first place. Could it be? Could this moment in time have been a direct consequence of of their lacking devotion to the Creator who intended for them to be devoted to Him only? Your life without God, listen, your life without God is formless and void. Without Jesus, there is darkness all over the surface of the depth of your heart. But the Spirit of God is going to move today. I believe that. The Spirit of God may have already been moving in your life before you even came into this room. Maybe that's why you're here today, because I don't believe that anyone is in this room today by accident. Sure, it's Easter, and more people come to church on Easter and Christmas time. Sure, but it's still no accident that you're here. You say, I made that choice to come. You absolutely did. And you have a choice also to decide what you're going to do with the fact that you're here. Without Jesus, there's darkness all over the surface of the depth of your heart. But the Spirit of God is going to move today. And if you will open your ears and if you will open your heart, you can hear Him say, let there be light. And there will be light. And this will be day one for you. Our passage today is the essence of God's grace because it teaches us that God continued the momentum through Peter, what he had set in motion through Jesus, which is the direction to seek and to save the lost, whether Jew or whether Gentile. And that's a reason to say amen. This isn't an us versus them thing. This is thank you for letting us be part of them thing. You know what I'm saying? The Bible refers to it as adoption. And as you know, I have a sincere heart for adoption. I believe in the closeness of adoption. All three of my children, I've told them since the moment they could understand what I would say to them, that God created them to be in my life and my wife's life. God created them just for us and allowed us the opportunity to pour into them. My prayer on a regular basis is that what I do in my life, 
doesn't reflect poorly upon them, but makes them proud to call me dad. And I want you to know something. I fail them on a regular basis. But I know this. When I was adopted into the family of God, he has never failed me one time. Not once. I may not like what he has done in my life sometimes. I may not have planned it this way. I may have had other things that I wanted to do. But his plan has never gone wrong in my life. I stand before you today a sinner saved by grace. Preaching the word of God, the good news of Jesus Christ to sinners who are saved by grace. We are one and the same. God is not a respecter of, of ethnicity, of race, of gender. He's not even, even a respecter of age. When He calls you, God wants you to respond. He wants you to answer His call. And this passage right here makes it very clear that that's what we're supposed to do. I want to read it to you again, and this time I want to read it to you from a paraphrase of the text. And I want to be clear that the Message Bible is a paraphrase of the text, but I love how it says this. So listen to this. We're almost finished. Listen to this. I want you to know what the Message Bible says about this. It goes like this. The same passage I just read from you from the English Standard Version says, Peter fairly exploded with good news. Isn't that cool? He fairly exploded. Have you ever had such news pent up inside you? You had to get it out right? I want to tell you something about my daughter, Grace. This girl can't keep a secret to save her life. Never. There's not maybe one. I'll give you this credit. There's maybe one present in my entire life with her that she has not told me what it was before it was time to open it. Am I telling the truth? Megan, I'm telling the truth, aren't I? This girl can't keep a secret. Because she gets so overjoyed about it. She wants to tell you about it. She's bouncing. She's happy. You want to know? You want to know? I have to say, no, Grace. I have to give her that, that, that air like, no, keep it to yourself. No, I don't care enough. No, hold on to it. Inside, I'm like, yes, I want to know. Of course I want to know. Why wouldn't I want to know? What am I, an alien? So, Peter, that's what I think about. I think about grace. And when, when I'm reading here, Peter exploded with his good news. It's God's own truth, he says. Nothing could be plainer. God plays no favorites. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do so, as he says, the door is open. Somebody say amen. The message he sent to the children of Israel that through Jesus Christ, everything is being put together again. Well, He's doing it everywhere, among everyone. You know the story of what happened in Judea, in Judea. It began in Galilee after John preached a total life change. Then Jesus arrived from Nazareth, anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, ready for action. He went through the country helping people and healing everyone who was beaten down by the devil. Have you ever been beaten down by the devil? Jesus preached a message to help everyone who was beaten down by the devil. He was able to do all this because God was with him. And Peter says, and we saw it. We saw it all. Everything he did in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, they were, where, they were kill, where they killed him, they hung him on a cross. But in three days, God had him up, alive, and out where he could be seen. Not everyone saw him. He wasn't put on public display Witnesses had been carefully handpicked by God beforehand. Us, we were the ones there to eat and drink with him after he came back from the dead. He commissioned us to announce this in public, to bear solemn witness that he is in fact the one whom God destined as judge of the living and the dead. But we're not alone in this. Our witness that, is, that, that he is the means to forgiveness of sins is backed up by the witness of all the prophets. How many prophecies did Jesus fulfill? Over 300, exactly. Over 300. As the band comes, as we prepare for this time of invitation and this time of communion, listen. 
We weren't originally counted, but we were always counted for. We weren't originally counted, but we were always accounted for. God knew what he was doing when he sent Jesus for us. And now he's calling you. The question is, will you answer? That's what he asks of you. We're going to have a time of invitation now. I've asked you, will you answer his call? Some of you say, well, I've already answered his call. I answered his call a long time ago, and you could tell that story. And I want to hear that story. I'd love to hear that story, how God called you and how he took you from where you were to where you are right now. Some of you have already answered that call. Some have forgotten that call. And maybe today would be a good day to renew your commitment to that call in, his, in your life, his call in your life. Why not today? Why not make today day one? of a renewed relationship with Him. Some of you have never answered that call. And my prayer is that God spoke to you through His Word, through the story that Peter was so excited to tell that just exploded from him. The story, if you didn't catch it already, the story is this. You, without Jesus Christ, are a sinner destined to eternity in hell. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You can come up with all kinds of reasons why that's not true. But I'll tell you, you'll never convince me that it's not true. I know what it's like to be a sinner. I know what it's like to live a life that is separated from God. Even though I was young when I made the decision to follow Him, I tell you what pushed back so many times. I know what it's like to push back. The good news is this, that even though I'm a sinner, Jesus paid the penalty for my sins. The Bible tells us that when he hung on the cross and he was very near death, he made a single statement. A Greek word to telestai. History has told us that that word was written across legal documents. The word to die was written across documents that, well, you ever pay a bill in full? How good does it feel when you have that bill and you pay it off and you don't owe that debt anymore? And somebody stamps on there, paid in full. I don't owe it anymore. How good does that feel? Now imagine you have a debt that you could not pay. You cannot save yourself. There is nothing you can, you can be the best person in the world. You can, you can help people. You can, you can pray for people. Even if you don't know exactly what you're praying, you can pray for people. You can come alongside people. You could feed the hungry. You could give all of your money to the poor. You could go to a foreign country and you could do all kinds of medical aid and stuff like that. You could be the best person by any definition. You could be the best person. But the Bible is very clear that without Jesus Christ, you are not saved. You are still going to go to hell. You're like, that's not fair. Well, it's also not fair that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can have the opportunity to be with him in heaven for eternity. Listen to me. God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son, His only Son, to die on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins. If you believe that with your heart, if you confess it with your mouth, the Bible tells us that we will be saved. That's good news. And when you understand that your sin is a debt that you could not pay, and when Jesus died on the cross, He said the word, to die, which means paid in full. I take it. I take it. Don't blame them anymore, Father. That's good news. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. That's grace. And the Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of anything that you can do, not by works, but by faith in Him you will be saved. That's good news. Amen. We're going to have this time.